our loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the privilege we have this evening together in our Saviour's name. Lord, we thank you that we can come to adore him, to adore our Saviour, who willingly took on our human flesh, who willingly went all the way to the cross, to undergo suffering that we know nothing of, suffering and death, to be raised again and raised to the Father's right. We thank you that we worship him who has all authority in heaven and in earth. We thank you, our God, that even as we gather this, this evening, while darkness and sin abound around us, while men's hearts faint for fear and the things coming on the earth, yet we know that our Lord surrounds his people with his lips. Lord, we lack for no good thing because the world is our shame. And so we have come to worship and adore him this evening with thankful hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll continue our worship by turning to Psalm 56, verses 1 to 3. Actually, verses 1 to 4. Sorry, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 56 on page 51. And not to my trust is in the Lord. And we'll stand in the Face together, prayer. Let's look to the Lord for His help as we continue together in the house of the Lord. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee this afternoon for the privilege that is ours to meet together here in the house of the Lord, to meet together for this season of worship. We thank the Lord for the ordering of our circumstances that enables us to be here this evening, to be in the place of worship, to meet collectively with the saints of God. And we come at the outset of our gathering here rejoicing in the goodness of God to us. Oh Lord, we give thee thanks that we creatures of dust are able to come and worship the Almighty God. Yea, we recognize in one sense that what else can we do? And yet what a mercy it is that the Almighty God would delight sinners as us, creatures of dust, coming into the presence of the Almighty. We thank thee then that we come not only to the God of creation and providence, but we come to the God of redemption. And, oh Lord, we thank thee for the blessing that it is to trust the Lord as we have been singing in the words of the psalmist here, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. 
Oh Lord, what a blessing it is that while we live in the fear of the Lord, that we walk with Him, trust Him. Oh Lord, we pray that later in Thy will, when we leave this place, that we will go away living more in the fear of the Lord, and yet that we will also go away trusting more in the Lord. Deepen our walk with thee as a result of spending this time in thy presence this evening. O oh Lord, we look to thee that throughout the gathering that we will know the Lord's help and that this season will not be one spent in vain but that truly we will meet afresh with our God. We pray for any that have come through these doors tonight still unconverted or for any that will be watching online or listening later. Oh Lord, we pray that the word read and preached in this house tonight will be owned and blessed of thyself, that thou will be pleased to take it and apply it effectually. Oh Lord, we thank thee that this is our hope, that the, the Spirit does take the word, that he does apply it. Oh Lord, if we did not believe this, and we would be in despair, but we thank thee that thou art well able to take even the word tonight and use it for thine own glory. Oh Lord, we pray to thee that you will be pleased to Bless the work of God in this place. Oh, as we thought this morning of the perishing that have never heard how many there are around us and effectively they fit into that category. Perishing, but they've never heard. They certainly have never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. Oh Lord, we cry to thee that opportunities will be given to present the message. Pray for those that pass by this property and they see the texts. Oh Lord, open up their hearts to the truth, we ask. We pray for those that have received tracts and invitations in recent times that they will carefully consider the matters before them. Oh Lord, we pray that sinners around us will be unusually constrained. Consider their latter end. Bring on converted ones in unto the sound of the gospel. And then we think of those that have long heard the gospel evening they have no desire to be in the house of the Lord for they have long hardened their hearts. Have mercy upon loved ones that are far away from them. It is our earnest desire that we will see loved ones being brought unto thyself. Oh Lord, after years of sowing, we pray that there will be a reaping. Grant to us thy help this evening. Pray that every part of this meeting will be on to the Lord's honor and glory. We pray in our Savior's good name. Amen. Amen. worship our friends in 435.
Thank you, Lord, that we have that confidence that when we come to the end of our journey, there will be that fear not. The Lord will bring us safely home and yet right throughout our Christian life. What a blessing to hear the Lord minister to us. Fear not, my Lord, my Lord. Please. We're going to turn in the Word of God to 1 Kings, 1 Kings, uh, the chapter 18. And in the early part of this chapter, we read of Obadiah. There are a number of Obadiahs in the word of God, including the prophet Obadiah. Uh, this would be a different individual. Uh, the name means servant of the Lord, and so it's understandable then that there were a number, uh, some we only read their names, but there were a number that had that name uh, through the scriptures. 1 Kings 18 and uh, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of or the steward of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. They have said unto Obadiah, we'll go into the land unto all fountains of water and on to all brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him, and fell on his face, and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldst deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Is it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? I, I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? Now thou sayest, Go. Tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He shall slay me. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So that I went to meet Ahab, and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. It came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel but thou. And thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel. 
prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? The Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We're going to have the catechism at this point in the meeting. Um, this question 56 of the larger catechism. So we've been looking at the subject of the Lord's exaltation, the Lord is exalted uh, and his exaltation is demonstrated in his resurrection the ascension him being seated at the father's right hand and then in his coming again why is christ to be exalted in his coming again to judge the world christ is to be exalted in his coming again to judge the world in that he who was unjustly judged and condemned by wicked men shall come again at the last day in great power and with the full manifestation of his own glory and of his fathers with all his holy angels with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpets of god to judge the world in righteousness and so the answer here as it relates to the lord's coming uh, emphasizes one particular aspect of the lord's coming uh, and that is the lord coming as the judge and so the question uh, shows us that will be the focus christ is, uh, how is christ be exalted and coming again to judge the world and the lord of course is also coming again to bring his people with him and bring his people to glory it will be the great resurrection in association with our lord's coming again and there'll also be those events that have to do with the destruction of the earth in its present form and the renewing of the earth the new heaven and the new earth but this answer is focusing on the judgment and so christ will be exalted in that judgment and so while the trial of our lord was full of injustice when our lord comes again and judges the wicked it will be perfect justice and there will be no flaws in the judgment uh, that will take place when our lord comes again now it speaks here towards the end of the answer of the lord coming with all his holy angels and we have that in a number of places in scripture he will come with a shout and we learn that in first thessalonians 4 as well as first corinthians 15 and with the voice of the archangel which is in first thessalonians chapter 4 uh, the trumpet of god to judge the world in righteousness and it's interesting that the writers of the confession draw out those details of the trumpet sound in association with the lord coming again in judgment and with the, the voice of the archangel um, and the, the coming with his holy angels and the reason why i say that is interesting because the emphasis of first thessalonians 4 of where you have those details is of the lord coming for his own so first thessalonians 4 and the verse 15 for this we say unto you by the word of the lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the lord shall not prevent or shall not go before them which are asleep for the lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of god and the dead in christ shall rise first 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And so you'll see that the emphasis there is very clearly on the Lord coming again for his own. And so there is this emphasis then here on the, the shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet. And as I said, we also have that over in First Corinthians chapter 15, where it's described as the last trumpet. Now, what is interesting then is that today there are some that will teach that 1 Thessalonians 4 has nothing to do with the day of judgment. And they time it at a different time than the day of judgment. And evidently, the writers of the Catechism were not in agreement with that position, which is not a surprise since that particular theory came at a later time than the, the writers of the Confession. So are the writers here correct? Well, they are, because when you go on into 1 Thessalonians 5, which is not a different event, some would like to make it to be a different event, it talks about the day of the Lord coming as a thief in the night. And what will happen, verse 3, when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction and it's not talking about two or three comings of the Lord. There is one coming, but there are different aspects to it. And uh, God's Word makes that so clear to us. Over in Matthew chapter 13, where you have the parable of the tares and the wheat, the Lord makes a very, very clear statement uh, about his coming again. Matthew 13, 40. And as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world, or in the end of the age. The severance of the godly from the ungodly will be at the end of the age. And there's no other way to explain what the Lord is saying there. He, he made that abundantly clear. And therefore, as the Lord made that clear scripture, it uh, makes it easy for us where to interpret other passages that are more difficult to interpret. The Lord has made it clear that there is one day, as we saw this morning, Romans 2, verse 5, it's the one day of wrath, and yet also the day when the Lord will bring his people home. And of course, that day then it is a day that comforts us as the Lord's people. The other day, that the ungodly need to be warned of. They need to be ready for that day of judgment. May the Lord bless those thoughts to our hearts. And thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one gathered with us. Uh, we look to the Lord for his help as we continue uh, in the house of the Lord this afternoon. Uh, God willing, on Saturday morning, we'll be having another literature distribution if you're able to help with that we'll be meeting here at 10 and if there are others that aren't able to help with leaflets but would like to do some uh, work around the property uh, if you could let them know about that as well so the service is next lord's day at the usual times and next lord's day will be the final lord's day of the month and therefore it will be the church lunch next lord's day We're going to have our offering then, uh, so we'll ask for the best. <laughs>
We'll turn, please, in the Word of God to 1 Kings 18 again. First Kings 18. I think this is probably one of the lesser well known incidents in the life of the prophet Elijah. And we look to the Lord for his help that we might glean something from this particular incident. In verse 15 Elijah said to Obadiah, as the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him, unto King Ahab today. I will surely show myself unto King Ahab today. We'll seek the Lord's face together in prayer. Let us each pray that uh, the Lord will come and touch our hearts through the truth of his word this evening. The words before us, a fresh message from the Lord. Our gracious Father, we thank thee that thy word, though old, is ever new. O oh Lord, we pray that this incident from all those years ago will something fresh for us tonight, and we pray that thy people will be helped through it. Dear Lord, we pray for any who are unconverted that even through this passage that you might minister also to them. Grant that need of help of the Holy Spirit of God. Give that in filling for the ministry of your truth. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Obadiah is certainly one of the lesser known characters in the scripture. And yet his accomplishments <coughs> and this brief interview that he had with Elijah ought not to be overlooked. Now Obadiah, this particular Obadiah, has been regarded by some writers, wrongly I believe, but has been regarded by some writers as a bit of a compromiser. It's easy for people like us living in days of religious freedom to point the finger at Obadiah and lay that charge. But the argument goes something like this, that he was working in the palace of a great idolater. He seemed afraid to go and tell Ahab that Elijah was now in Samaria. And so he's represented then as being a weak man, as being a fearful type of character. The truth was that Obadiah was a man that greatly feared the Lord. If you look with me at the verse 3, here we have the comment of the Holy Spirit, and that surely helps us then to understand how we are to interpret this passage. Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Obadiah feared the Lord Greatly, and that was Obadiah's own testimony. At the end of the verse 12, he said, I, thy servant, fear the Lord from thy youth. And I think this passage then is something very important for the young, for the young Christian, very especially. That early impressions. Early spiritual impressions are to be lasting. He was a young man that knew the Lord in his youth. He feared the Lord in his youth and he continued to fear the Lord greatly. And his fear of the Lord resulted in an act of great courage. For Obadiah worked in the palace of King Ahab. He was not a cleaner. He was not looking after horses. But he was one of the chief of staff. He was a governor or a steward in the palace. 
And when Jezebel sought to put to death the prophets of the Lord, this man that was right next to Ahab in the palace, he took a hundred of those prophets of the Lord and he hid them, he concealed them, he fed them. That took great courage. I'm sure it also took great expense, great organization to feed 100 men. Do you think of this? Here was a man, the chief of staff of Ahab, and he very deliberately undermined the policy of the king's wife, that ruthless woman Jezebel. Yet he would turn up as normal to work every morning as if all was normal. Does he sound weak? Does he sound compromising? To me, he sounds exceptionally courageous. <coughs> he wasn't the first, normally be the last, who worked in very difficult circumstances. Daniel labored in a very ungodly atmosphere. Queen Esther. In the New Testament, we read of Christians who were in Caesar's household. And so the fact that he was in a very prominent place, and yet still a child of God, does not mean that he was of necessity compromising. Yet I assume he didn't make a great announcement in the palace about what he was doing. I'm sure he didn't go before Jezebel and boast that he had hidden prophets in a cave. Because that would have been foolish. He would have undermined the very thing that he was doing. He kept it a secret so that they could be done. If he had told that the whole matter would have been undermined. Now there's no doubt that Elijah and Obadiah had very different personalities. Elijah was a very public character. He was bold as a lion. And yet, even this man that could stand very courageously before the king and look the king in the face and say, you're the man that has troubled Israel, not I. Even this man, the Lord had taken and hidden for a few. But Obadiah was most likely a quieter man. He could work in the background, protecting God's servants, every day showing himself to the king. And of course you must understand that during that time that Obadiah would turn up to work every morning and he'd hit prophets in a cave. Elijah was actually away conceived. Now, of course, it was right that he was conceived. That was the Lord's purpose. But I think what it shows us is that Obadiah was not the coward that some would like to paint him to be. So I presume he was a quieter man. And yet, the Lord uses different men in different ways. He equips men for different functions. But each has a function. Was there a need for Elijah? Yes, there was. And though we had more of them today, and yet was there a need for Obadiah? Yes, there was. And though that we had more of him today as well. And yet it's true that when Obadiah met Elijah, and Elijah said to him, Go and tell King Ahab, Elijah is here. Obadiah does seem fearful. Certainly. He's saying, I, in effect, I don't want to do that. Why are you asking me to do that? Have I done some particular heinous sin that would mean that I have to go and tell Elijah, or sorry, tell Ahab, behold, Elijah is here. So Obadiah does have fears, it seems. He fears that if he goes and speaks these words to King Ahab, Elijah is here, 
but it will result in his death. So here's a courageous man, and now he is fearful. But would you not have been? He doesn't want to die. But is that such an unusual thing? He wants his life to be spared, but is that unique to Obadiah? Would you have said, yes, here am I, willing to be the martyr? Uh, I think most would prefer that we might continue to serve the Lord in our own quiet way. What we find then in Elijah's reply to Obadiah it is really one courageous man ministering to another. One courageous man ministering to another that he might know fresh courage. That the courage that Obadiah had known in preserving those prophets would be courage that he would know now in exposing a prophet. For you think of Obadiah's mentality. He was trying to keep the prophets away from Ahab. This was a complete change of policy. <coughs> Telling the king exactly where the prophet was. It is upset then one courageous man is ministering to another. Don't be afraid to do this. Go and bring these words to King Ahab. Elijah is here. I've entitled the message then very simply, Don't Be Afraid. Don't Be Afraid. I want to draw first of all from this, Obedience to God overcomes fear. Obedience to God overcomes fear. As far as the record of scripture is concerned, the instruction to Obadiah was brief. So, as far as what's recorded for us here, it's saying that the Lord, sorry, Elijah said to Obadiah, Here are the words that you're to speak. Verse 8. He answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. Behold, Elijah is here. Now, Elijah, sorry, Obadiah, in his response, he twice refers to these words. First of all, in verse 11, he says, And now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. And again, verse 14, Now thou sayest, Go tell thy Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. Are you really telling me that these are the words that you want me to speak? The first time that he raises the words in form of objection, verse 11, Obadiah is saying, King Ahab has been looking for you everywhere. He has sent these delegations to all the countries right the bottom. In effect, if he knew of a nation or a kingdom, he would send an embassy there to try and find the Lord. And he would make them swear that they need not be the point. And so Obadiah is saying, do you think that King Ahab is going to take it kindly when I go and say to him, you have made all of these searches, but Elijah is right here under your nose. And then the second time he quotes the words of Elijah in verse 14, he's really saying that when I go to find Ahab, in the time that I go to find Ahab and then Ahab coming by, the Lord will take you out of the way so that Ahab won't be able to find you. And then where is that going to leave me? Because I will have raised hopes in Ahab and they'll be there. So then I'll be the one that faces the wrath of King Ahab. So how does Elijah respond? Verse 15. Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, I will surely show myself. I will surely show myself unto him today. So I'm saying to you, 
Go and say Elijah is here. And I'm making this pledge, I will show myself unto the king today. Now that's significant because if you go right back to verse 1. In verse 1, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Show thyself. Show thyself unto Ahab. Verse 2, Ahab went to show himself. And then in verse 15, Elijah says, I will surely show myself. What is he in effect saying? He is saying, I will obey the Lord's command. The Lord has commanded me, the Lord has commissioned me to show myself unto King Ahab. That is what I intend to do. And so, because I intend to be obedient, you don't need to be afraid. My obedience of the Lord's commission it enabled you to cast out these fears that you have had. Both about how Ahab is going to react after all these searches. And you don't need to think that I will disappear. I'll be waiting. Because I intend to obey the command that the Lord has given. And so what I'm suggesting to you then is that obedience casts out fear. God's plan and purpose was greater than Obadiah's hesitancy. The Lord so ordered the events that Obadiah would be the one to conduct Ahab to Elijah. Obadiah would be the one providentially that would enable this meeting. And so the Lord had purpose that Obadiah would be in this very difficult workplace, that this event today might happen. The Lord had restrained Ahab, that Ahab had not dealt with Obadiah for his belief in the true God, so whatever the reason for that was in the mind of Ahab, the Lord so ordered it. That the Lord would use Obadiah on this occasion. And so surely it was like Esther. Remember how we read in the book of Esther, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And it was true for Obadiah then. Oh, Obadiah. The Lord has put you into that position and the Lord has spared you in it. So that today I can't be obedient. Do you not see that you're the answer? How can I meet King Ahab? You will enable it. And I intend to obey. And surely there's a very practical lesson then in this for the Christian in the workplace. Don't be in despair when the workplace is hard. For it may well be but you're an Obadiah. The Lord has placed you in a very difficult circumstance there where you're certainly tempted with compromising. You're certainly tempted with reacting wrongly to circumstances around you. But the Lord perhaps has you there because he's a very special task for you to perform. And therefore, what are you to do? Well, Elijah was really saying, I am to be obedient. And therefore, Obadiah, I am pleading with you to be obedient. Go and give the word unto the king. There are many things that can make us afraid. One of the ways in which obedience is to work in the life of the Christian is that obedience is to dismiss fears. One of the ways that we are to dismiss fears is through obedience. And if you look with me in John 14, John 14, uh, this is a very well-known chapter, I'm sure, to us all. Uh, John 14, and verse 1, 
and I think the chapter is well known, this verse is certainly very well known. John 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. And the chapter outlines a number of ways in which the disciples could be delivered from their heart trouble. A number of ways in which the disciples could be delivered from fear. I'm not going to go through all of them. But one of them is obedience. If you look with me at verse 13. If ye love me, and of course that was their profession, we love the Lord. If ye love me, keep my commandments. You want to cast out the fear? You don't want your heart to be troubled? Keep my commandments. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. So again, here is this idea of obedience. You want to be rid of the fears? As you love me, then keep my commandments. John 15, 10, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then in verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And we think of what the scriptures tell us about Christ's joy. He was anointed with the oil of joy above his fellows. So the opposition against him was greater than what any man has endured. And yet he had joy above what any man has experienced. And here's one of the keys. Obedience. In 1 John 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. And I've shown you then, John, that this perfect love is associated with obedience. Perfect love with obedience casts out fear. So, obedience in the life of the Christian is not some op optional extra. There are many today, and they like to characterize commands as being legalism. Now, it's certainly possible to be legalistic, but much of what people claim to be legalism is actually the issue of Christian obedience. Obedience. Sometimes we reason, I can't obey this command because my circumstances are so exceptional. I, I can't keep the Lord's day holy because these are my exceptional circumstances. I, I don't need to worry about giving my offering to the Lord because these are my exceptional circumstances. Really? What is the result? It's fear. When the Lord's people are disobedient, there'll be fear. And I'm sure all pastors have found this to be the case when they meet with fearful Christians. Often it can be traced back to an issue of obedience. Because compromising Christians deprive themselves. Do you remember? What the Lord said to the disciples in the boat, Mark 4, verse 4, Why are ye so fearful? Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? No faith. You see, we excuse our disobedience, and we say, these are my exceptional circumstances, but really what we are saying is, I can't trust the Lord to be obedient at this time. It's a lack of faith. We're to be obedient at all times. 
We're to take God at his word at all times. This is what Obadiah was learning then. But even though, humanly speaking, this doesn't seem to make any sense, I can be obedient unto the commission of the prophets. Elijah can be obedient to the commission directly from the Lord. Through the obedience to the casting of the So obedience to God overcomes fear. I want to see then, secondly, that access to God overcomes fear. If you look at the statement of Elijah again, in verse 15, Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. Before whom I stand. Now, Obadiah had used part of that statement when he immediately answered Elijah. So going back to verse 10. Obadiah says to Elijah, As the Lord thy God liveth. Now, if you remember right back to the first afternoon, we looked at these studies, and these words actually come from chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 1. So the first time we meet Elijah, and the first time, as far as the scripture record tells us, that Elijah met King Ahab. Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before him I stand. And so Obadiah quotes part of it. As the Lord thy God liveth. But Elijah then, in verse 15, he reminds him of the entire statement, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before him I stand. Don't forget that important detail over there. Before whom I stand. Now, as we saw a few weeks back then, that statement has a number of significances, but one of them relates to prayer. Elijah was really saying to Obadiah, I have access to the living God. I have access to the living God. I stand before the living God so I can stand before King Ahab who serves dead idols. I have boldness to enter the throne of grace. Therefore, I have boldness to stand before a wicked king. Now, Obadiah, of course, knew the truth of what Elijah was saying. He had experienced it. I've already mentioned this detail that he greatly feared the Lord. If someone greatly fears the Lord, they know what it is to pray, don't they? But Obadiah knew what it was to pray. He had been enabled then to preserve the life of those prophets. Here was Elijah then saying to him, Fresh. I am before God in prayer. And I am before God even in relation to this meeting. I'm not seeking to evade it. I'm praying that the meeting happens that I stand before Elijah, or that I stand before King Ahab, and I get to bring the word of the Lord to Ahab. As we grasp privilege prayer. If we really get hold of this truth that we as mortal beings come into the presence of the immortal, that truth will deliver us from needless fears. I was reading last week of John Patton, who's one of my favorite mission missionaries. John Patton missionary to the New Hebrides, as it was then, was a very courageous man. And yet sometimes he was placed in very fearful circumstances on account of his missionary work among what we regarded as savages. He wrote these words, However our hearts 
sometimes trembled in the presence of imminent death. The sight within us. So he's saying there were times that outwardly it looked as if he had reached the end of his ministry. He was going to be murdered. He said that we stood fearless in their presence. And so he trembled, and yet at the same time, we stood fearless in their presence and left all results in the hands of Jesus. Often have I had to run into the arms of some savage when his club was swung or his musket leveled at my head and praying to Jesus. How could the man that who's experiencing deep fear appear to be fearless? He's saying it's because I was I have access to the God of all power, thereby fears they overcome. And surely then, we don't need to be afraid of dangerous commissions. When the Lord sends us into circumstances that naturally would make us afraid, we don't need to be. We have access to God in prayer. And in such circumstances, prayer will enable us to keep priorities. It's interesting in this particular passage that King Ahab, as the ungodly king, had very distorted priorities. What is Ahab doing when we meet him in this chapter? He says to Obadiah, we need to find water for the mules and the horses. We want to save them. So you go one way and you and I go the other, and we'll try to find water to save the animals alive. All the time in the land, there were widows and orphans perishing. He wasn't saying, let's go and find water for them. He was more interested in the animals than the people. And I'm not suggesting, of course, that we don't have to care about the animals. I think you'll agree with me that his priorities were distorted. But prayer helps us retain priorities. William Carey said, I'm not afraid of failure. I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. Am I searching for those words? I'm afraid of succeeding at things that don't matter. Doesn't the devil put many things before our attention that we want to succeed in, but really in the end, they're not of any great relevance, they certainly of no return to us. May our success be and that which is eternal as we grasp this access to God to the Lord's fear. But I want to see then finally with you the truth of God overcomes fear. That is, as we meditate over the truths concerning our God, it will enable us to cast out fear. And particularly here, as we think of God's authority, God's supremacy. The Lord's providential control, the Lord using restraint, all of these things teach us. We don't need to be afraid. And so Elijah says then to Obadiah in verse 15, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. I stand before God. Now, Elijah had said to Obadiah, you stand before King Ahab. If you look at me in verse 8, he answered him, I am, I am Elijah. Go tell my Lord. Go tell your boss. Go tell King Ahab. And of course, Elijah wasn't saying, you don't stand before God. That wasn't the point here. But Elijah was saying, in your work, you stand before the king. The king is your lord. As a result of your work, you have to honor him. 
And that then should remind you of various truths. As I meditated over this, I thought of that time when the Lord was dealing with the centurion that had the sick servant. Remember how the Lord commended that particular centurion for his faith? Because the centurion said that I am a man of authority. I have soldiers under me. When I say go, they go. When I say come, they come. They follow the instructions that I give because I am a man of authority. And the centurion was drawing attention to that because he was saying to Jesus Christ, you are the son of God. You have authority over sickness. And so you don't need to come into my house in order for my servant to be made well. You just speak the authoritative word and my servant shall be healed. Now follow that logic. Obadiah stood before the king. Unless the instruction of the king was simple, Obadiah could obey the instruction of the king. And they have given the instruction. Done. God had given the instruction Elijah to appear before Ahab. God will make it happen. And so God will restrain Ahab that the meeting might take place. Ahab won't come running into that meeting with a sword to destroy Elijah straight away. Because God is going to exercise his restraint that Elijah gets to say what he has to say. And so there's so much evidence in this passage and the story surrounding it that teaches us that our God is a great God. How was it that Ahab sent all of those messengers through the countries round about and nobody could find Elijah? Especially when Elijah was in the very territory of his father-in-law. How embarrassing that was. But God was preserving Elijah. We have a great God. How was it that a widow and her son, that were at the point of death because they had no food left, just enough for one meal, when they received a visitor, that they survived and thrived after. Now in normal circumstances, surely that would have raised the curiosity of the neighbors. Surely in normal circumstances, they would have been wondering how come it is that this lady is still alive when there are three in that house? And a few days back, they, they didn't have any food or they only had enough for one day. And yet they survive month after month. Surely God was restraining the people round the body that they didn't have curiosity, that they didn't even seem to be asking, who is this man that's there? Why was it that this wicked man Ahab, who was married to an even wickeder woman, Jezebel, would permit having a man of God as his chief of staff. Again, it has to be we have a great God. And Elijah then said to Ahab, we have a great God, the living God. Let us trust him. Let us trust him. Obadiah, you can go and say to Ahab, I have seen Elijah. He'll be in such and such a place. Obadiah's life would be spared, and so also would be Elijah's. They could trust their dear God. 
and Obadiah le learned the lesson, he went. Elijah also learned it. He had preached to himself. For as Ahab came, he came with this accusatory question, Art thou he the trouble of Israel? In verse 17. The prophet looks the king in the eye and he says, It's not I the trouble of Israel. It's you, O king. Surely Elijah had learned the very lesson that he had sought to communicate to Obadiah. Fears are to be cast away. May we take these words then to our hearts tonight. As the Lord of hosts lives. As the tomb is empty and Christ is on the throne, as he says in heaven, I am he that was then, and behold, I am alive forevermore, we do not need to be afraid. We have victorious Savior. May we be encouraged then to go forth with fresh courage and to stand for the Lord in this evil day. May the Lord take his word and write it upon our hearts. We're going to sing in closing please the words of the hymn 570 570 and we'll stand together as we listen to these words and to the words.
Our gracious Father, we pray that Thou will take Thy truth this evening and seal it to each one of our hearts. We pray that we might indeed go forth from this place with those words ringing in our ears. Fear not. Fear not. I am with Thee whithersoever Thou goest. We pray, Lord, that in all of our going out and coming in, yea, amidst all of the things that would naturally cause us to fear, we pray that we will have our confidence in the strength of Almighty God that we might overcome. Amen. O oh Lord, we pray that more and more that we might live in faith, casting out the fears. We want to him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Saviour, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, with my endeavour 